Welcome to the forge, my wanton wildlings. I'm your creepsmith, and I hope you like my work. Among the long-standing tropes in horror, there is one that I'm particularly fond of. The Forbidden Tome. Books that hold forbidden knowledge have the ability to affect the world around them, even ones that will hunt you down and end you. Maybe it's because of some preternatural influence or entity, Maybe it's because of our own unfettered curiosity or heedless need for knowledge. Who can say? In any case, such discoveries have their price. And just as a warning, the story of tonight's lunatic librum involves mentions of suicide and explicit gore. But on with our telling of the fly paper notebook. Author unlisted. This is a pretty nice city, Chicago. It's big, and because it's so big, you may never see the same person twice. I sometimes curse that reality when I'm working on my latest project. Actually, it's, it's less of a project and more of an investigation. An investigation of a peculiar thing that happens in the city library. Let me explain. About eight months ago, I'd say mid-November. I'd been assigned a bit of a weird duty by my teachers. They requested that I start researching for a new paper that I was to turn in at the beginning of next fall semester. I'm working on my PhD in Modern American Anthropology at DePaul University. They wanted a paper from me to find the profile for the most average American possible, using statistics, culture, language, all of that good stuff. It was an odd project, but I figured that I could do it. I had the internet and the library, and I had a list of volunteer interviewees that had volunteered to be questioned for the human sciences majors should I want to do a survey. I haven't worked on that project for weeks. Let me explain how this all started. Mid-November came around, and the school library had yielded as much information as it could give, which was unfortunately not enough. I decided to migrate all of my studies over to the much older but much larger city library. I packed up my laptop, wrote down the names of all of the larger reference books that I used, and began the trek to the train station to head over to the right side of town. I arrived at the library about 10 o'clock a.m., and as soon as I walked into the main lobby, I was marauded by the screams and giggles of a visiting elementary school class. I tried to smile and push my way through the sea of tiny faces and brightly colored t-shirts over to the main staircase. I trekked up the stairs to about the third floor before I left the staircase and headed over to the computer to look up the location of the books about which my paper was centered. Floor 9, West Wing. Great, I thought to myself sarcastically. Six more floors to climb before I can begin. I'll be in great shape by the time I'm done with this paper. So I climbed and climbed and climbed. Finally, I reached my destination and took out four or five books, fired up my computer, and began working. I worked through till about 3.30 p.m. before I began to get hungry. I leaned back from my chair, stretched my arms into the air, and then pushed my glasses up my nose. It was only then that I realized that there was another person on this silent library floor along with me. A young girl, maybe 18, 19 years old, was browsing through the books on the shelves across from me and the other work tables. I remember remarking to myself that either I was working very hard not to have noticed another human being enter the room, or she was just incredibly quiet, or more likely, a mixture of the two. I thought nothing of it at the time, and began packing up my things. As I was doing so, I noticed the girl come to the table and sit down with a peculiar-looking book. I didn't see where she'd got it from exactly, though I just assumed it was from one of the shelves. 
it didn't look like a book that's printed and bound and published en masse, but more like a simple notebook with lined pages and flimsy paperback like you would get at an office depot or Staples. She was reading it very intently, and I could see something written on the book's front cover, but it was written in black and was hard to read against the dark blue paper cover. I decided not to intrude and continued packing, and she continued to rip through the words on the pages with her eyes. As I lifted the strap of my computer bag over my shoulder, the girl dropped the book onto the floor with a soft flapping of paper. Her eyes were fixed on the opposite wall and glazed over, apparently in awe. I looked across the room to where she was looking, but I saw nothing except more bookshelves. I could tell immediately that it was something she'd read that caused her to be so dumbstruck. There was no indication of anything in her eyes. They were unmoving, unresponsive. She slowly rose from her seat and silently moved across the room towards the stairs down to the main floor. I followed with caution and a bit of curiosity. After a twinge, I looked back over my shoulder and saw the small notebook still lying on the ground. I was hungry and my bag was heavy, so I didn't involve myself in preserving the library's belongings and followed the girl down the stairs. Her eyes were still completely dead and glazed over. This young woman did not make a sound through all nine floors of stairs. She walked slowly and silently, looking half focused on the stairs and half in deep thought about whatever it was that the book had revealed to her. She went out the front door of the lobby. I was still following her a few feet behind. She pushed open the door and stepped out onto the sidewalk. I followed, keeping the door open, still intending to go to lunch and not to have to endure any kind of drama, and instead of walking left or right, the girl kept walking straight. She walked in between the bumpers of two parked cars and right out into traffic. I panicked as she walked out into the street. I quickly ran to try and grab her shoulder before she wandered into the busy street, but it was too late. A large pickup truck, horn blaring, plowed straight into her. The driver slammed on his brakes, but it wasn't quick enough. Her neck snapped left, then right, and her head slammed into the pavement. Blood splattered everywhere, and the truck finally screeched to a halt. It had skidded so far that the girl's body was now up underneath the bed of the truck and the driver just sat in the driver's seat in shock, knuckles white gripping the steering wheel and him just staring at the splatters of blood all over the windshield. I ran over to the girl trying to pull her out and see if she was alive. I was able to grab her hand and I pulled, but then I realized that the arm was broken. Her elbow was shattered and her forearm and upper arm had been dislocated and now it was just a bloody tube with fragments of bone floating around inside and bits of gravel sticking to it. Revolted, I, I bent way down and peered under the car. Her neck had been rotated and snapped. Her chin was sitting on the back of her shoulder as she lay stomach down and I could very clearly see her face. Her skull had been all but completely crushed. There was blood dripping from her nose and it was pouring out of her mouth, but her eyes still held that same exact expression in them, glazed over, looking at nothing, staring out into space. It was strange that I thought she was still alive for just a second, J just for that second that notion that she hadn't been harmed by the accident crossed my mind. I mean, sure, her brain was ground into the tarmac by a truck tire and sure the blood soaked every piece of my clothing so much that I'd had to throw every piece of it away but her face hadn't changed that dead-eyed look that had come over her way up in the ninth floor of the building was still plastered onto her face now it would never be removed again I just stared at her for a second then I heard the sound of sirens and stood up. 
The police had come and were blocking off the area where the accident had happened. I told them everything that I've told you here. They took notes, but they didn't seem particularly interested in the book. I was shaken up. Really shaken up. I was no longer hungry and just decided to go home. The library closed for the rest of the day. It was tough to sleep that night. I just wanted to go upstairs and find that book. Nothing plagued my mind more than what was in that book. That thing had killed her. Either up on the ninth floor or down in the street, I couldn't positively decide which in my mind. What I had witnessed, whatever it was, had me convinced that the book was responsible for taking a life that day. I was both ravenously curious and deathly afraid of what was in the book. If I did go up to the ninth floor, should I read it? Could I even find it? Uh, had the police taken it? Was it still sitting on the floor where that girl had dropped it? These things I did not know. The library didn't open for days. I've been looking for this book for over a week now. I've scoured every single shelf on the ninth, eighth, and now seventh floor. I've asked the librarians about any such book, but none had seen it. I asked all of the janitors, none had seen any book like it. I even asked a policeman who visited me to ask about anything else that I had to say. He said no such book had been taken into evidence. The case had been closed and the death was deemed an accident. The driver was acquitted, seeing as how he'd had almost no time to stop and did make sufficient effort, and probably could not have done anything anyway. I keep thinking to myself, I have to continue my research. Looking for this book is ridiculous. There's no point in it. Even if I do find it, the chances of the book being the cause for her death are slim. She must have had mental problems, or maybe it really was just an accident. Maybe it was something completely different that she'd remembered that caused her to be so distracted that she walked straight into traffic, or perhaps the thing she remembered had made her so depressed that she simply had to end it. This book is unlikely to be the reason that she died, right? Even with these realizations, there were still some things that simply didn't add up. If the librarians hadn't done anything with the book, nor the janitors, nor the police, then who? There was very little time for anyone to go up the stairs after the girl and I went down, and if someone had happened to go all the way up to the ninth floor, they would have had to go over to that particular table among dozens to be able to find it. It was very inconspicuous, after all. I think I may need to see a therapist. This thing is haunting me. I need to put it behind me, and I'm not getting any work done. I think it may be happening again. Somehow, someone else found the book, I think. It's been three weeks since she died. I now have an office the library lends to heavy researchers. When I found that out, I was, <laughs> I was very pleased. It has a computer and plenty of space. There are just a dozen like this one uh, next to mine up here on the fifth floor. I've been getting a lot of work done in the office, and uh, it's been over a month now since the incident with the girl. I was thinking about it less and less every day until today. As I'm writing this, I'm glancing up every few seconds out of the window in the office over to a table in the library. Sitting on this table is a kid. A boy, maybe 16 or 17, is sitting there reading the book. I know that it's the exact same book. It has to be. I watched him bend down inside one of the aisles and pick it up. I know now what I have to do if he drops it like the girl did. I have to grab it. I'm considering going out there right now and getting it from him, but I want to see if it puts him in a trance like the girl. 
He's been reading it much longer than the girl had, but just as intently. And the kid dropped it. He looked up now, just as the girl had. But now he's looking right at me. I can tell. He's, he's looking at me. There's no mistaking it. I rose from my chair, and he hopped off his seat at the table, his eyes still dead focused on me. I open the door to my office and walk out into the library. The kid's still staring, unblinking and intent. He begins walking toward me, but now has just walked around the table. What was in the book? I half shout to him. His face grimaces. He begins walking steadily backward, away from me, toward the other side of the library, and I begin walking towards him. What was in the book? I shout this time. He flinches and looks very annoyed. Now he's grinding his teeth. What's in the book? I shout even louder. I was now passing the table that he'd left the book on. I went over to grab it, but before I could, he flipped around and started into a dead run. He ran like the hounds of hell were at his heels. I was watching him. It wasn't five seconds before he reached the opposite wall and the very large window there. Running at an impressive pace, he dove through the window. The glass shattered, and he fell out. I screamed. I didn't know what to do. It was the second time that this had happened. I ran over to the broken window without the book. I looked down, and there the boy was face down in a parking space. His legs were twisted into horrific positions. His body was five floors down, but I could still see that he was alive for the time being. He was moving, but bleeding badly. He must have been in extreme pain. He was squirming, and both of his legs were broken. Perhaps one of his arms, too. I couldn't tell. I went back to that table. The book wasn't there. I smashed my hand into the table in frustration and sadness, and I sat down in a chair and gazed into my office in thought until the police came to question me again. Of course, they did. The, it was even the same cops. I told them what I've told you here, and they seemed not to believe me very much this time. There were witnesses for the first accident, but not for this one. There are no surveillance cameras in libraries. There was a law a few years back banning them. They didn't want the government monitoring what it was people were reading. They couldn't honestly believe that a kid just jumped out a window because of this same book. I couldn't blame them either. It boggled my mind for months. It still is, as I sit here in holding at the state house. See, I'm on trial for the murder of this boy. The physiologist I'd been waiting for came in to give me the evaluation, sat down, and put his briefcase on the table. Good afternoon, Mr. Baker. Good afternoon. I've been quite anxious to speak with you. I've studied your case quite thoroughly. He spoke very kindly. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you claim that both the boy who fell out the window and the girl who was hit by the car a few months ago, both of whom you were near when they died, were reading some sort of notebook right before they died. Yes, I explained for the thousandth time since I'd been there. Please, describe this notebook to me, he said as he opened up his briefcase. Well, it's small, thin, has a dark blue paper cover, and it has something written on the, the doctor had removed a few of his papers, and sitting there in his briefcase was the notebook. The very same notebook. Yes? He said as he gazed at me in curiosity. He saw me looking at the notebook, wide-eyed and apprehensive. He saw it too. Hmm. What's this? He held it up and opened it. I could see that on the front was written the word flypaper. I began to breathe very heavily. I pushed my chair away from the examination room table. 
I sat there, against the wall, looking only at the notebook which had plagued my thoughts and killed two people already. The doctor read the book intently for about a minute. Slowly, he rose from his chair without saying a word and without an expression on his face. I could see only a single tear running down his cheek. He turned around and opened the door into the room. Just outside the door was an officer who was guarding the room. The doctor reached down, slipped the gun out of the officer's holster, put it in his mouth, and pulled the trigger. Blood showered over my entire body. I didn't even notice it. There was the book, sitting on the table. I, 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 I panicked. I grabbed the book and ran for it. I hopped over the doctor's body and spun around the cop like an Olympian. I sprinted down the hallway and found an open janitor's closet. I ran in, shut the door, and flipped on the light. And there I was with the book. I opened it, and BAM! A cop had opened the door and smacked me in the back of the head with a nightstick. I blacked out. I woke up in a hospital, cuffed to my bed, still covered in blood. The cops testified to the fact that the doctor had killed himself, and not me. I, I, I told them about the book and how I was in the closet to read it when the cop hit me to keep me from escaping. They searched. They said that there was no book in the closet. So, here I sit, in this cell. Here I will sit for two and a half years for the unintentional manslaughter of three people with antipsychosis medication. No, I'm not in prison. I'm in an institution. The handlers here don't treat many people well, including me. I tell them all day, every day, that I am not crazy. They beat some people. They force feed some people. They completely neglect some people. They have to force me to take my medication every day. And now I've found the notebook in my cell. I have not read it. And two of the most horrible handlers have found the notebook as well. So I gave it to them. They no longer bother me, nor do they neglect any of the other patients. Every day, I think about the book. It always feels like it's just daring me to read it. I always feel the temptation. I'm always curious about what's written in there. What's in the book? The notebook always finds its way back to me. I know better than to read it. I know better. I've seen what happens when one reads this book, but I just want to know. I just want to know what it says. I just want to know. So, about this notebook, what do you think is its issue? <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. Stay scary, my wildlings. Maybe try to curb that curiosity just a bit and make the most of your nights. <laughs>